Hi, this is Adam Hughes, and you're listening to the Top 5 Comics Podcast. Welcome to the Top 5 Comics Podcast, people talking about comics, pop culture, and events. With us here today, we have CBS in the action. Hello. I guess I'm throwing a punch and then frozen. That's that's good times. Action. We also have the Man of Steel, Rob. Hey. I guess. <laughs> Man of Steel. That's why we have Superman in two places, Rob. Yeah, well, that's true. That's true. No, no standard, just, just Superman. Just you know, action then. Well, that's the tricky one because it's Superman in action. Right. Instead of just action comics. That's the one that's a pain in the butt anyways. Right, so that's why we have a file under two places, under action. No, under S for Superman, because it promptly features Superman. Under A for action. Action. And also visiting us later, we have Josh45. All right. Well, welcome everybody to the Top 5 Comics Podcast. Uh, this is episode number 112. Oh, yeah. And uh, today we're going to be doing a little bit different. We're going to do, uh, so book-wise, we're going to be doing Action Comics number 1000. And that that's it. It's like a standalone kind of thing, because it's a pretty big book. It's a pretty big deal. You know, it's Action Comics 1000. That's a pretty monumental thing. I mean, book-wise, we don't get numbers high like that anymore unless you cheat and you add them together. So there's, there's a small amount of cheating. Oh, uh, that's true. In, in this, too. Well, yeah, well, you add the 52 in there to... Okay, 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 so yeah, there's some cheating. Yeah. It's not nearly as bad as Marvel's cheating. But... Well, it's a different thing, I think, you know. It's gimmick. Which is whatever. That's a thing. But they they did let action stand at at least it's 900 for a while. Well, ran through the ran through the numbers, I mean, as far as the thing. You added the original run, the volume one, to the volume two... Which had 52, 52 issues, and then transpired with the new Reborn, and we moved forward from there with Rebirth. And the Rebirth, of course, it was coming out twice a month, but that's no different than when Action, when, when Spider-Man was coming out f- four times a month. So number-wise, it at least progressed forward, yeah, quickly, but as a thing, it fits the current trend of what they're doing. So that's all right. Yeah, no, that's fine. Yeah. Um, so we got a little bit of news today. I mean, ultimately we don't have Ross in the dog pile, so that's an unfortunate situation. You should really email us in and be like, we want Ross in the dog pile. Unless, of course, you hate the dog pile, which in that case, I guess, don't say anything. Take that, Ross, and your pile. That only really hurts me inside, because he's not here. Anyway, so a uh, little bit of news. So uh, a while, a couple of episodes back, we were talking about how we are getting a shift over to Action Comics. And we're going to have Brian Michael Bendis taking over for both Action and Superman. And a lot of us kind of wondered what Peter Tomasi was up to. Well, apparently Peter's been working on another book that's called The Bridge. And that guy's, I want to say it came out this last week. So he's promoting that and pushing that book. And ultimately what The Bridge is about is about the Brooklyn Bridge. And this is like a story based out of real history. Artist for it's going to be is uh, Sarah Duvall. So the book is basically about how the, the Roblings family, the group that built the Brooklyn Bridge... It's about the construction of it and like the crazy things that happened during the construction and like how a lot of the guys that were working on it while they were up on suspension wires got uh, compression sickness and so like it's, it's like a historical based book dealing with that particular piece of American, our American, I don't know, history, I guess history. Yeah, it would be. It would be American history. So like as a thing, a pretty neat thing. I mean, it kind of is reminiscent of uh, our buddy that does the, uh, like the world history of beer and did the, uh, the Declaration of Independence. Yeah, Hennessy. Jonathan, yeah. Yeah, Jonathan Hennessy. Oh, yeah, actually, so that was, I said that earlier. John, so John Hennessy, kind of like what he was doing with that stuff. Yeah. So as far as the thing, uh, I don't know, pretty neat. I mean, the couple pictures I got to see from it today look, look I mean, it looked good. As far as the story, I mean, I never really followed a whole lot of history um, comic book stuff before, until John, of course. And then, you know, with a couple books he bring us that we that went through. So, but other than that, I've never really dealt with them before. So it's an interesting idea, an interesting thing. Did you know that um, on most bridges, if not all bridges, 
there is a hidden troll. Really? Yeah, evidently it's a luck thing, and it's gone back for forever. So most iconic bridges, even even most like small bridges, have a hidden troll somewhere in them, including the Brooklyn Bridge. Yeah, interesting. So you can look that up in the world because they're they're there, but you may not be able to actually see them yourself physically because they can be hidden anywhere on the bridge. No, it makes sense. So uh, yeah, Google it, people. That's what the internet's for, apparently. <laughs> um, other news, and this one's a little sad, and I, I probably should I didn't I probably should lead it with this one because the Tomasi thing is really cool. Um, so Miss Allison Mack got herself in some trouble. And if you don't know that name, uh, if you ever watch Smallville, then you know her as Chloe. And uh, Allison, apparently somewhere around 2010-ish, got herself involved with a pyramid cult scheme. Um, I guess it's the best way for me to describe it. Uh, so this, uh, like, I want to say yesterday, maybe? So here, here, depending on when you're listening to this, recently, from when this was being released... Allison got herself arrested for sex trafficking and trafficking of people for labor. Um, as in like working. So yeah, she got herself in some pretty bad trouble. Um, and according to like the stuff coming out about it right now, there's a few other, they had a couple different base locations. One of them was in Brooklyn. One of them, of course, was in, uh, in, uh, in Canada, uh, where a lot of filming stuff's done. So we had a couple different actors involved. Not heavily in it. Apparently, Allison was pretty heavy in it. And, uh, what little bit we know about it, like, she had some issues after her, like, a divorce. And I think probably then is when this dude picked her up and put her into his cult and made her one of his lead acolytes. And, yeah, it's pretty messy. There's a whole lot of stuff online about it right now. Of course, because it's a real recent thing with her being arrested for it. He was arrested. Uh, at this point, they both faced charges. That could lead up to 15 years in prison. So, yeah, it's good times, which is really sad because I th- thought she was a. I find her to be a quite attractive actress, and like personality-wise, up until all this stuff, she seemed fairly normal. Granted, I mean, you never really know, I guess. But yeah, as a thing, that's uh, you know, be careful, careful who you hang out with, I guess. Huh? Pyramid schemes everywhere, Rob. That's true. That was kind of one of the big things that was coming out with um, Far Cry Five. They, when they were doing that, they researched cults, and you kind of think, oh, there's not that many cults. Somewhere around 50,000 in the U.S. alone. See, so what we really need to do is get on starting a cult. No? I don't, I don't even know how this thing, it, it just sounds like Amway went bad. That's what it sounds like <laughs> to me. Amway went bad, and part of it was a party. I don't, I don't understand. Uh, well, yeah. As far as that side of things, I guess the stuff she's been implicated with most is recruiting for the supposedly all-female portion of the cult, which I knew how to say it earlier today, and now I'm trying to remember how to say it, and I can't remember the name of it. It's like Niel. It's got a lot of vowels in it. No, not vowels. A lot of consonants in it. Not a lot of vowels. So, like, the pronunciation... uh, yeah, how you, how you make that a name of anything I don't understand. It's like that XYZZZ road out in California, between Nevada and California. I'm sure there's a phonetic way that supposedly pronounced that. How? No idea. Secrets and lies is what I say there. Anyhow, well, we, I hope, hope for Allison to get her act and life together and not have to serve 15 years in prison to figure it out. But yeah, supposedly she's connected in a way that like, they create a brand to brand the inner circle members and the brand includes her initials. So like how, or it's just a weird design. I mean, you know, you can kind of create anything out of anything, I guess, but yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty, uh, pretty dark. What's what the whole thing was about. So I guess we'll see what happens with that. Uh, you know, sad day. Strangely enough, there's actually a movie made off of that road. Oh, there is, yeah. Yeah, it's it's evidently terrible. It has a very mm. low Rotten Tomato score. That's uh, that's what I've been told, mostly because I heard it just now. No, I heard it before. That was that was a joke. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, that's actually the same road they use whenever. Uh, so in slots, when our main character drives out to the to the road to dig up his gun and bullets, that's the road he's on. Yeah. If you didn't read slots number one, you can go back and reference it there. 
or listen to the episode. Oh, well, I mean, we talk about it in there, so, yeah. you know. And then buy the book. Yeah, there, there, there you go. And then buy the book. Okay. Um, okay, so other news, so we can get off that particular topic. Uh, so Ant-Man and Wasp finally revealed the big bad, which, depending on how ingrained in comic books you are, you probably already knew this was coming, and the character is, is the ghost, which, I mean, Marvel-wise, I don't know, Rob, what do you know about the ghost? Uh, Ghost has been around for a while, but is not necessarily one of the big movers and shakers in in Marvel. I think recently biggest contribution has been in the Thunderbolts run, and basically has a suit that can allow him to be intangible and invisible at times. The super paranoid, like, um, Unabomber type guy who who just like wants to exist outside of society, but has become kind of bummish, I guess. Like, he's he's left reality so much in his, like, intangible state that he's a bit creepy, even though he's actually very smart. And I kind of wonder, because, like, the movie talks about also dealing with the idea of trying to find the Wasp mom, so the original Wasp, and in my head, so the little interview I, that, that I read... And a little bit of information is online, like from the movie, or from the movie website. They make a big deal of saying, oh, it might be a guy or a girl. Well, in the comic books, it's a guy. And the look okay. appears to be a guy. But in my head, I'm like, you know what? That, that's setting me up to believe that it's actually the wasp mom. And it's all a big ploy to cause problems. So, uh, that's my guess. If I was going to feature a guess about the movie that's going to turn out the main villain is actually the wasp mom, Janet. Why? I don't know. Well, and I mean, with with the Ant Man property, they've already devol- diverged quite a ways from from any of the comic book stuff. I mean, Yellow Jacket is a great example of that because it's two completely different characters that they kind of sound together. And that version of Yellow Jacket has never existed in the comics. Which I mean, way to go! I mean, it's like Whiplash. Nobody's going to complain that you made the character better. <laughs> well, there might be one or two people that do. Name is not to be mentioned. Hmm. But, um, I mean, so, like, really with Ghost, he's another one of those characters you can kind of get away with. Like, like with Vulture. You know, as long as you make something better, I don't think many people are going to be that upset. No, I agree. So I guess we'll see what that winds up being true. Like, that's my guess, but again, it's, it's just a guess. You know, I've got a lot of those these last two weeks. Hmm. I, I kind of wonder if he's not a big main part of that story. But there's there's a lot of power suit flunkies out there. I mean, there's a, oh yeah. Iron Man has a pretty deep rogues gallery of characters that are not very good. If you ever want to laugh, look at the unicorn. <laughs> so yeah, by trivium and Ant Man, I guess you can transfer across the board. I mean, power suits are power suits. So yeah, well, I, Ghost has the potential to be kind of super crazy and creepy and. But, I mean, honestly, I think during that whole run, we may have seen him once, if that. Right. I mean, he was he was there. We just He's always got the mask on. So, he could be anything underneath, really. Yeah. It'd be interesting to see how it boils out. Um, so, I guess the last thing I really have to go over, well, I guess there's a couple of things. So, the King Conan movie apparently has been derailed, um, which is unfortunate. Apparently, this isn't the first time that's happened either, because back in 2009, apparently, there was an attempt that for some reason got derailed also. Probably because um, Arnold decided to do Batman Robin with Mr. Freeze, which seems like a weird choice for him. But I'm sure the paycheck was probably pretty good. But yeah, anyway, so the newest one derailment, not entirely sure why. It's a real recent thing that came out maybe two weeks ago, which is sad, because I think a King Conan movie would be great. Yeah, it would be. It would be awesome. Heck yeah. You know, I didn't know he was supposed to be in Predator 2. Oh, yeah. Well. yeah. But he wanted way too much money, and they were just like, no, nah, whatever. Right. We'll, we'll, just, just, <laughs> we'll just get Barry Boosie, whatever. Yeah. Yeah, well, the weird things happen in Hollywood. Um, so another bit of new, well, newer news. Uh, so He-Man and the Masters of the Universe uh, apparently has been realigned for a duo set of directors. So they've changed directors over there again. Uh, they're still saying it's going with the uh, the David Goyer movie script. So I guess we'll see if that sticks, because apparently it's slated to release 2019, December. So I guess they've got better part of a year and a half to figure it out. 
But uh, they aligned uh, Adam and Aaron Nee to uh, direct it, which not uh, – between the group of them, I mean, Adam's more of an actor. Well, he's been a lot – he's done a lot more acting than directing, I guess. Uh, but him and Aaron are both connected to, to a movie called Band of Robbers, which came out in 2015. The only thing I've seen for it is the trailer, and the trailer looks freaking awesome. But I haven't actually seen the film. And then before that, back in 2002, there's a movie called Last Romantic, which I never saw either. And then there's a whole bunch of like short film stuff that they, that they did. And, uh, Adam was part of the group in the, uh, drunk history episodes. So as far as that stuff, I mean, they did a lot of shorts. There's one that's called, uh, Clark Kent had a dream that was a short of some type. And I, again, it's something I never even heard of till just the other day. So, what it is or how it connects to anything, no idea. Because it looks like a comedy thing, so not like something legit. Anyhow, so I mean, there's that. I mean, we're getting another He-Man, so that's pretty cool. I guess we'll see what happens with that at some point, or in 2019. So, good luck, future uses. Hopefully, it doesn't suck. No, only me. Okay. Well, that's enough uh, Hollywood weird news nonsense, I guess. Um, all right, all right, all right. I don't do that very good as an impression, but when I'm making fun of Matthew McConaughey, there's only two lines I like. That's one. The other one's about high school girls because he's a bad man. It's true. Yeah. Anyway, um, I, I killer blame, abs, though. Killer abs. I blame the mustache. Yeah, no, it makes sense. It makes a lot of sense, actually. Um, let's move into comic books, Rob. Just to let you know, there will be spoilers. You want to kick us off a little bit of Action Comics 1000? Sure. I wish I could do that better, sorry. Action Comics 1000! Thanks a lot. Made me look real bad. Good so, job. Sunday, 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 Sunday. Sunday, Sunday, Sunday! Go on, Rob. So, this has a ton of different artists and writers in it. Well, as a book in general, yeah. Let's go and break them down, like story to story, not just do like a overview type kind of thing. But yeah, we'll do do each story per section, I guess. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. I so first sense. section, Action Comics one thousand, and go. Yeah, so written and drawn by Dan Jurgens, the first story is kind of a callback to a more kind of classic. Superman story, which is basically the city of Metropolis wants to have a celebration for Superman. And Superman would rather be doing anything other than standing there and, and getting accolades. Right. Well, they, allude, they, they talk about how he's missed them before, and this time around, Lois is really about him being there. Kind of being there. And there's there's a lot of cool little things in there. They kind of fake you out at the beginning of it. But, I mean, ultimately, it's a pretty it's a pretty good story it's very sentimental it's very connected to the kind of older superman mythos and it kind of hammers home the it's more important what superman does than what superman's powers are kind of story and that he doesn't just inspire other people people are inspired by him as well right or i'm sorry let's try that again it's not just that people are inspired by him but he's inspired by people as well Right, well, it sells the idea that while we gain inspiration from him, he gains inspiration from normal people that stand out, too. Yeah. So it's like a vice, a real vice versa kind of thing. It's not just one way. But it's, it's kind of a nice celebration of the things that he does and his connection to the rest of the DC universe. And kind of seeing a little bit of slice of life with Lois and John. But I mean, it's really just kind of hammering home the idea of Superman... Being for the people, I guess, you know, and, and the small things that he does along with the big interstellar things. Right. Well, yeah, the way it plays, the, the idea of him off the crowd is really cool. Like, a, a story, I mean, it, it's a pretty good story. And Dan Jurgens written, he's written a lot of Superman stuff. And, like, as far as, like, stories are concerned, yeah, like, this, it is a simple story, but at the same time, like, I got kind of teary-eyed a little bit. Just a little bit. Which is not normal for me. Especially with whatever, but, because I hate everything. But as far as stuff, like, it was, it was a pretty good story. Like, it was very, like, this is why people should like Superman. And the idea that people don't get to read this because they won't bother is sad. 
Anyhow, anyway, that was great. Uh, Rob, you want to give a score for that particular part of this book? Uh, I, I liked it. I would give it a, I'd give it a four out of, out of five. Mm-hmm. You know, that might be a little more sentimental than it needs to be for, because I, I do really enjoy a lot of Jan, Dan Jurgen stuff, but I don't know. I, I, I'd say four. Yeah. All right. Um, but you know what? I, I, I'm going to follow, I'm going to, I'm going to go a little higher. I'm going to give it a four and a half. I don't know if there's anything such as a five. I mean, there's been a couple books I've gotten through our show in general. I don't think for me, but as far as like a set up for a story, yeah, it's sentimental and it is more classic Superman style story, but like weighing what he has to weigh in life and like how during throughout the story, he's, he's constantly like, man, I know there's some more problems out there in space. There's something else wrong. Like there's something I know that needs to be taken care of and like trying to balance that between his family life and then what the people want and trying to just figure out a way to balance that in the middle is like something he constantly struggles with as a character. I mean, he's always got to do worry about his power. And he's always got to worry about what he uses and he always got to worry about his strength. He's always got to worry about everyone. So like, I don't feel like a lot of stories get to show that, but it's because it's not something you could, you want to think about all the time. When you read an action battle, it's more about the battle. So I don't know. I like how that's in this story. Anyway, that's, that's all I got for that part of it, I guess. So uh, yeah, I you so four point four and four point five. If we rate them separately, that would be a that would be a win for me. <laughs> I, I guess it's a silly way to do things. Silly, but now we started and you just can't stop. <laughs> All right, so uh, we'll move on to the uh, the second story in here, and uh, this guy picks up pretty seamlessly one to the next. This particular story is by the same group that's been working on Superman for the past I don't know forty issues. Uh, with Patrick uh, Gleason and Peter Tomasi, so Pat and Peter, both characters, we, uh, people we talk about on the show quite often, uh, only because their books are great and they're both amazing. And this story, like when it opens up, we open up basically with a Vandal Savage battle, which is really pretty cool because Vandal Savage, I think, is underused a lot. I mean, yeah, they used him in the Legends of Tomorrow show, but they didn't really iron him off the way they do in the comic books. And uh, the story itself basically sets Superman on this crazy time loop that Vandal's built to trap him in history or the past. And so we get a lot of different takes of Superman throughout this entire little story. So we see him like 30 style, 40 style, 50 style. It's it's really kind of cool how this costume shifts happen throughout it. And we see one where he talks about remembering in this particular timeline, oh, he didn't have the heat vision. He didn't have all the different powers. And it's basically the, the original origin of Superman back when he first started. Because when he first started, yeah, he could leap buildings in a single bound and he was faster than a speeding bullet. But all the other powers, he had other weird powers, that's true. We don't talk about those, because they were weird. But like, the ones he doesn't have that he has now, he talks about how he, how he felt super energized just with having to do where everything was simple to know who's bad and who's good. And it goes throughout the story telling stuff like that, and when he's in the, like, I would say 50s-ish era, he talks about how you knew who, who you were to fight because the suits were different, their flags were different. You knew who was good, you knew who was bad. And like, it goes over that stuff a little bit, and then he talks to himself about how he's, he can't get lost in that, because at the end of the day, he has one real motive, and it's to get home. And that whole thing pays off throughout the story, because we get a lot of different flashes, different timelines, and a lot of different action sequences, and really great action poses, and great action fighting, and all kinds of cool stuff. We can get Silver Mansion here for a second, which I thought was awesome, because she's great. I dig the Silver Banshee. Yeah, she's a neat character. And, like, storyline-wise, we even get Flash to Kingdom Come. Like, that doesn't happen often at all. So that was really cool. And there's, like, the way the story unravels, it irons out the sentiment, sentimentality, if that's a real word, of, at the end of the day, Superman's whole goal is to get back to the people he cares about. And you can't beat him by putting those people in danger, because that's the only thing he's worried about. And you can't beat him by dangling shiny things in front of him or feeling good about what he's doing because at the end of the day, the path always leads home. So he's all about family. And I thought that was really cool. And I, I feel like these guys have done a great job with their Superman run. I mean, art-wise, it's great. Story-wise, it's great. Uh, the only thing I wish that we would have had Mick Gray do the inking on it. Um, that's it. Just because I think Mick's, Mick's awesome. Not this guy did that. I mean, inking's great too. I just, I like Mick. 
And uh, anyway, so yeah, for like a score for it, man, I gotta give it four and a half too. I thought this was out of the park. I mean, story wise, yeah, it's it, there's not a whole lot of super intrigue to it, but as far as like ironing out how Superman works and getting to show off different things about him and the different costumes was great. I thought that was freaking awesome. If the only cost, if the only cover of this book you ever see is the Jim Lee cover. It's a great cover, but the other costume is like from throughout time for Superman. That was awesome. So yeah, I give it four and a half. Uh, Rob, you got a score for the uh, for the story there. I'd, I'd probably give it a little bit less. I I'm thinking probably three and a half. I enjoyed it a lot, and it's the cool thing about it is that it's a really neat run through of Superman's kind of past without having to go step by step all the time. Right. Um, but I, I, I thought it was cool, but it was very much like a remember your life kind of thing for me. And so I don't know. It didn't quite resonate as much with me, but I, I did enjoy it still. So sure. yeah, I'd say three and a half. All right. That's all right. He's their own, you know, is what, is what it is. I can't help if you're wrong. <laughs> no jokes. I only have jokes for myself, apparently. Well, that's okay. The cat's laughing. She's laughing inside. Um, all right. Well, let's move on to the uh, next little section of that, of this uh, giant-sized 1000th edition issue. Bum, bum, bum. So this one's been written by Marv Wolfman, with art by Kurt Swan. Right. And then we actually have a bunch of different inkers. Yeah, there's a bunch of people that filled, that helped ink the book in a couple different colors too. There's yeah. even like a throwback to, uh, to, uh, Cindy, which I thought that was interesting too. Um, this particular story is actually all about the other people in Metropolis. Because as much as Superman saves the day, he isn't everywhere all the time. Sometimes he's, he's in space. Sometimes, He's in another plane of existence. Sometimes he's just off in Japan dealing with killer robots. Right. Brainiac invasion. And, and in this case, um, the Gotham City Police has to do something. They don't. They can't just sit around waiting for Superman to solve all their problems. The Metropolis Police. The Metropolis Police. I'm sorry. Did I say Gotham? Mm-hmm. No. Yes, the Metropolis Police. Gotham Police do things too, but not in this story. <laughs> well, that's true. Mostly hanging on top of buildings, which sounds freaking awesome. It happens sometimes. But, um, so in this particular story, while Superman's out, Maggie Sawyer, captain of the police, is dealing with a violent situation at school. Kind of like a, a school shooting sort of thing, except for in this case, it's the teacher. The principal, yeah. The principal, yeah, who was holding one of the students hostage. And uh, stuff looks like it's going to go bad. And there's no Superman to save the day. So he's off doing his own thing. Now, as the story progresses, there's more than a little bit of a hint that Brainiac was playing a bunch of different kind of games. And one of the big things was he was using sound waves to try to override people's free will. But one of the big things that's trying to sell in this is that Maggie can solve things on her own. Yeah, the whole story is basically some, excuse me, perpetrating the idea. Is that a way to say things? That, uh, there are people in Gotham that, or, I mean, I did too. <laughs> Damn you. People in Metropolis that get things done without Superman's help. Yeah. And like, the retrospective of his voiceovers throughout it are basically talking about that. So yeah, as far as the two things connecting, of course, as the things go on, Superman sort of figures that out and that becomes a big part of the story. Yeah, as, as they wrap it up. But, um, yeah, for me, Marv Wolfman is a super classic writer. I really enjoyed his time with Teen Titans, and he's actually come back and done a ton of different stuff over the years. This one was pretty good. I don't know if it was... So for me, this one didn't quite... It doesn't quite sell it as well uh, as, as some of these other stories. So I, I'd probably I'd probably go ahead and do a three for it. I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was a cool take. It's it's important to show that not every situation is solved by Superman. And we don't have a lot of time to do that because a Metropolis PD comic would probably not be really well received. But Yeah, by itself it might not. I don't know. They did did do a story a while back it was Gotham City PD. And that one worked okay, it ran for a while. 
but it's a different kind of flavor of things too. It's not quite the same as city wise. They're not the same kind of. They're similar, but they're not the same. Yeah. But yeah, so so I I give it a three. All right. Oh, you know, I fall asleep with you. I give it a three as well. I mean, Marvel, from, like you said, is classic. Uh, art style is a little more old school too, simply because of the, how it's connected to the original story, I guess. Which I don't know a ton about that, but as far as like a throwback kind of thing, it, interesting and neat, neat, neat little setup, and just the way they everything fits in the current modern era of craziness happening in schools. In, interesting kind of thing. Uh, but yeah, I know I give it a three. It was pretty good. Uh, so now we're joined in the uh, studio by uh, Josh Forty Five. What's up? What's up? Fresh in off the satellite? No, that's Ross when he's in space. Yes. Fresh off the bullet train? No. Fresh off the automotive? Fresh off the? I was trying to think of something Superman, and I just don't got it. From the Fortress of Solitude. Locomotive. Locomotive would work. Fortress of Solitude works too. Fell out of the Phantom Zone. Fell fresh from the Phantom Zone. There we go. Yeah. How is that so hard to come up with? That was that's brilliant. Fresh from the Phantom Zone, Josh Forty Five. I don't know if I like the Phantom Zone as much. Well, no, you're not supposed to like I it. Didn't it's do anything. A terrible wrong. place. It doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. Monel didn't do anything bad either. He was just stuck there because he was aging and dying. It's that kept him from dying. But there's cool people hanging out there. Mostly the bad guys, I guess. So Zod and whatnot. Okay, maybe not the best place to hang out, but at the same time, a good place to get out of. Hey! That's true. No? Only me? Okay. Um, all right. Well, I guess let's move on to the second story, or the third, fourth story, excuse me. Did we name the other two stories? I don't think I we don't did. I don't think so. I don't know that all of them had fancy names. They do. They all, they all have fancy names. Okay. Well, then, no, we didn't. I guess we can go through a track of the fancy names at the end. They'll be in the annotations. No, they won't. I'm uh, not, not going to put them in there. Okay. You want to introduce this one by story? So you guys just finished the Enemy Within. Yes, Enemy Within was the most the previous story by Marvel Wolfman. The story before that was Pat Gleason, Peter Tomasi, and it was called I don't remember. I noticed this Dan, the first one, the Dan Jurgens, like the art was like immediately brought me back to my childhood. Oh yeah, well, this Dan Jurgens would have been doing books in the nineties for sure. Yes, the Never Ending Battle though. Ah, so the second one, Never Ending Battle, that's Peter Tomasi and Pat Gleason. Okay. And the first one, the Dan Jurgen story, was called? From the City That Has Everything. Bum, bum, bum. Well, now you know. Now he's half the battle, G.I. Yeah, Joe. So let's move on to The Car. Is that the, what the next one's called? Yes. Yep. Hey, all right. Uh, do you want to tell me a story about The Car, Rob? Sure. Yeah, the, the Car is being written by Jeff Johns and Richard Donner, which is... Really cool, actually. Um, well, yeah, this is you're talking original Superman movie one and movie two. Okay. Uh, Richard with, Donner, that's that's how that connects. With uh, art by Oliver Coypel. Heck yeah, awesome. And actually, I, I guess Jeff Johns was like a studio guy for for Donner, he which is a, also was, an, yeah, back, an interesting connection. Back during the movies, the first two movies, the Chris Reeves movies, uh, Johns worked as an assistant to Richard Donner. So yeah, he, he's like eighteen or nineteen. So yeah, dude's been in the biz for a minute doing things. So this is actually a pretty, a pretty epically drawn story, and actually I, I really really enjoy it. But to get to the kind of the heart of it, we've got a guy who's done some questionable things, and his car is totaled, and he's talking to this mechanic. And as he's explaining the story, he talks about, like, being stuck up on a telephone pole by a guy in a red cape. Well, and, and underwear. Yeah. He made the images of the underwear. Basically, the, the mechanic guy is talking about, like, you know, it's going to be cheaper just to scrap the car. Just start over instead of trying to fix it. Right. And the guy's like, well, I don't know if I got a kind of scratch. And as he, he kind of starts to leave, we wind up having Superman show back up. And... He, He's like, oh, so you got down from the telephone pole. And I know we, we said we weren't going to go through all these like this. So it, basically the, the thing is he's relaying to the guy, like, I looked into you, and I know that you came from a bad place, but you don't have to be this guy. You don't have to throw away your life. You can still fix it. And you can be like the man in people's life that you didn't have and make them a better person. By being a better person. And it's kind of like, that's the kind of quintessential Superman. It's not the, I'm so powerful, I can make you do right. It's the, I can kind of show you 
how to do right or, you know, give you the inspiration, I guess, to make yourself better. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, and the, the Dan Jurgen story has that too in there where they oh, yeah. have the presenters and stuff. It's, yeah, it's, it's a quintessential part of who Superman is. But I, I felt like this was done really, really well. You know, I, and even though the end is like, I mean, obviously the guy doesn't turn around and become mayor of the city or anything, but like, <laughs> right. Um, I did like that they also had the very classic Superman look in this. So I think I want to say it was like, this is like the 40s, 50s look for Superman. Design wise, it appears to be. And like the, the time frame the guy's supposed to be from and even the, the car and everything, it appears to be 50s esque regardless of throughout the story. Yeah. But I, I really enjoyed it. So I, I give that one, I give it a four and a half. I, I feel like that one really hit it. Like, definitely hit it with me for a quintessential Superman story. So. Cool. I think that's what makes Superman, like, when Superman's written properly, like, it's hard to, like, the thing with Superman is he's so powerful and he's so incredible and he has all these amazing abilities. But what, when, at his core, he's just genuinely, he's a heart of gold. He wants the best for everyone and he is selfless. And <clears throat> that's being able to write those things together. Like, you put him up against somebody like Zod or Mongul, and it's just like he can go toe to toe with these people, these, these god like enemies. But when it comes down to it, he can also go against somebody like Toy Man, who's just a, just a guy who, likes to kill little kids and just like it, he has to use, you know, he has to use his heart and his mind and his everything. And it's not like sometimes superpowers are in everything. And it's just like, he wants to make the world a better place in general. He's not just trying to be, he's not out for revenge or he's not angry. And it's just like Batman's angry because his parents got killed. Like Superman's just, he's a good, he's good. He is what good is. And so it's like this story kind of shows that and he's just like, Hey, I know who you are. I looked into you and, do do it a little bit better, man. You don't you don't have to be that. And that's it's that that's like Rob said. Is I, I like that a lot. Yeah, and I mean they're touching on those themes over and over. They touched on it in the Dan Jurgen story as well. Yeah, that's so. what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, do you have a score for that particular story, Josh? I get a four and a half. Cool. Um, well, I fall asleep with you guys and give it four and a half. Also, like, I'm pretty impressed by it. I mean, it is simple and just to the point. As far as like writing, John's is just really good, and. As far as the art's concerned, I mean, Oliver Coipel is amazing. So uh, throughout this book, the art is amazing. Uh, but yeah, as far as the score for that particular story, yeah, I give it a four and a half also. I mean, it's, it was really, really good. And like when he first comes back and he finds the guy, he's like, oh, see, you got off the pole. I was coming back for you. So it's like, I didn't forget you. I didn't just happen to you again. Like, you're on my mind, man. So it's like, even though he left him in a precarious situation, he's coming back to t- deal with it. These are the things that, the people who are working on the films forget they're, they're building they're They're so worried about the powers that they forget the man, you know? And I think he's, I think that's an issue, but that's, that's for a different day. Sure. All right. Uh, we're going to move on to the next story, Rob. Be the fifth season, fifth season. And this, uh, this one's got a different kind of setup to it just in general. Cause we, we take place, and I'm not entirely sure if it's out of time or if it's uh, lined up in time just because the way the story plays out. Because there's some stuff in here that feels like it fits the old universe when Lex and Superman grew up together. But whether that's actually canon anymore, it's hard to say. Which I guess for this book, it doesn't matter. Yeah, that's what I kind of felt like is it's just it's a story that could have taken place in any nebulous time. But yeah, we, we talked about that a little earlier. Like, does it matter if it's canonical, canonical or not? Okay, that's a real I word. I don't think it matters. Canonical? Is yeah. That, is, yeah. That a, is that a real word? It is. Okay. Um, anyway, so this story, the fifth season, this is uh, written by Scott Snyder of Batman fame. And uh, Raphael Albuquerque is the artist. So if you know uh, American Vampire or a bunch of Batman stuff or you know anything else Albuquerque's worked on. Or it, Huck. Or Huck. Oh, yeah. Yeah, both. And like color tone, actually the color tone of this actually reminds me of Huck a lot. Um, when we first open up, we have Superman joining Lex Luthor and where they're at is like an observer, an observatory for, a uh, observatory, uh, observatory. That's the word I'm looking for. Yeah. For ast- for like, uh, things happening in space. So I know there's a better name for that. I can't remember what it is though. 
Okay, so pla- a planetarium. That's what those things are called. Anyhow, so Superman joins Lex, and Lex is there, and Lex is kind of talking to him, and he puts on a, a show for him, playing off all this stuff in the cosmos, and this whole time there's a, a, a script running behind it. So, like, some of you go watch an observer, abs- how to say it again? Observatory? A plan- yeah, observatory planetarium. And uh, the whole time, like, as, as they're talking, we get these flashes to Lex when he was a kid. Lex starts talking about how during a particular point in the season, which with this area, there's a particular point in the season that falls between summer and winter. That's not really fall. It's not really. No, it's it's the particular time of year after winter, but before spring where the, like the season is just so unpredictable. So right. it, it can do anything with tornadoes, winds, blizzards, anything. It's called the fifth season. Right. And where we live in Colorado, we, we, that's a very true thing. But during this particular season would be the easiest for him to get out of the house. And it was also the worst time that his father was the worst. He hit them harder. He was meaner. And so he starts telling the story about him and the kid in his class, how they built a miniature laser. And, of course, he's the one who's responsible for building it. And the other kid was just there. And he tells him about how he took it to the observatory to, to put it into the uh, to put it into the uh, giant the telescope. telescope. In order to increase its power and how he went and did it. And he never really understood why it didn't explode because hindsight from him, he forgot to bring anything to cool it. Yeah, it's, uh, he, he was going to send a signal into space to see if there was anything out there. An SOS. Yeah. yeah and, and he forgot to heat the liquid nitrogen. Yeah. You got to heat the liquid nitrogen when without that, it could have had this chain reaction that would explode. And it did, but it didn't explode like it should have because he could have died from it. Right. And we, we see off camera the reason why that happened, or why it did not happen. And then uh, there's a little more about him talking about growing up and about how the SOS in general was because he wanted to be saved by somebody, by anything, and how it coincided with a few other things in life. And uh, we get to the end of the storyline, he basically tells Superman that the real reason he invited him there was to kill him. And he tells Lex, I know. And the, the whole reason Lex is still alive with this whole incident is the reason why I think it didn't explode is because we see Clark as a kid heat vision it to keep the thing from exploding. So the entire, like, always looks, Supers looks out for everybody, regardless of who you are. So it's like another, like, story that lands in a way that's like just showing off how selfless he really is. Like, he knows he's there because Lex is going to try to kill him. And that's what Lex does. So Superman always knows that when he shows up to expect Lex to try to kill him. Because Lex is a bad dude. Um, score wise, I don't know, I give it a four. Like it was, there wasn't a whole lot of action movement to it, but I think it's really cool. The flashes back to the kids and like she's showing how Clark's always been looking out for Lex, regardless of what was happening. I thought that was really cool. And the art's great. I mean, Albuquerque is an amazing artist also. They're just really great artists throughout this book, but he's fantastic. Um, so yeah, I give it a four. Rob, give a score for Scott Snyder, who occasionally I throw eggs at. I, I do. I actually, I enjoyed the story quite a lot as well. Um, if there's one thing you can say about Albuquerque, he he does he does draw Lex a little weird. <laughs> but um, I I from from my take on it, I actually think Lex never knew that Supers was there. But I think through this story, oh, and he when they were kids, it. huh? I don't I don't think he ever realizes it at all. I, for for just me reading it, I think he does. I think he sees it now, and that's what changes him to like reveal why he was doing what he was doing. And, and kind of changing his mind in that particular instance, but re- regardless, like I, I thought it was actually a really well done story. So I'd, I'd give it, I'd give it a four. All right, uh, Josh, what do you think about that little story? Um, I give it a four, like just because it was. I mean, it was well written and stuff. But I was never a fan. Like it wasn't. Like I don't remember when in um in continuity that became a thing where that Lex was from lived in Smallville. That was later on. Like that's not, it hasn't been an always a thing. No, that, that's one of the things we were talking about at the beginning is where this fits in, in any kind of con- continuity. And, um, unfortunately it probably doesn't fit in any continuity at all. But I remember like on the TV show, Lex, like on Smallville or whatever, Lex comes to live in Smallville. And that, that well, I think that that's where that came from. Well, it, when they then, first introduced a uh, young Superman or Superboy back in the like 40s, well, it had to be 50s and 60s 
or even later, that was the whole premise for it, was that Lex and Superman were both in Smallville, and they grew up together, and Lex's hair was gone because of Superboy and his nonsense. And eventually, during one of DC's many, 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 many cleanups and crises and changes, they went, yeah, this continuity has to go because this is ridiculous. And so they took up the carpet and swept it underneath. But, you know, there, there's still stories that I guess people find interesting for that. So they just kind of went, like, eh, it'll be fine, just shoehorn and then. Yeah, and Smallville picked it up off of there. But the whole idea of Lex being bald, losing his hair because of Superman's ship crashing the, when he was a baby comes from that batch of stories. So, yeah. like, his hate for Superman is really because he lost his hair. Burr, burr, burr. Yeah, that that all came from the Superboy stuff. And there's there's at least a couple of versions of that because one of them is, is that. One of them is Lex was trying to work on a kryptonite cure because he just loves Superboy. And it started to fire and Superman blew it out. But the blow, blowing it out, it worked with the kryptonite cure and it made him forever bald. His hatred for Superman started then. But, like, it's it's not something that's a c- actual continuity in New 52. And it's been rewritten and unwritten and rewritten and unwritten so much by this point. Who knows? I, I would say that this was just a fun story. All right. And then from there, we move on to our next story, which is uh, Of Tomorrow. Josh, what do you know about Of Tomorrow? Um, it's written by Tom King. Um, it's drawn by Clay Mann. And it's, um, Superman's on, looks like a dying earth. And I'm not sure the sun's exploding, turn into a red giant. And he's there to, looks like visit the grave of his, his parents and, or his mom, his, his mom yeah. Pa Kent, and he like makes something like he makes a diamond basically out of a rock and carves it into his parents and him. And he talks, he's telling them about, how how John's doing and how Lois is doing and I, like he's like this might be the last time I come here you know I don't even know why I'm here because I don't even know if basically I don't know if there's like an afterlife or there's just nothing and he talked about how his dad like Pa Kent would just be, like get frustrated with him and like how he didn't as a kid didn't want to go to church and like how he was frustrated with his dad because he's like I don't understand like you do all the science of farming but yet you still believe in uh in God. He's like, but then you just, you reminded me that, you know, we're all just like stardust fallen. We're all part of the cycle. We're all part of existence. And, um, it, and that just kind of, he like sets this, the little diamond like statue that he carves on his parents' grave. And, and that's it. That's what ends. And, um, I thought it was fantastic. It's like, I, that's one of, one of the things, like why I've always been drawn to Superman is because he's so, he's so relatable. Like he's so like approachable. He's like, he he has a heart. He has a family. He has a life. He has like those those stories that I I always really enjoyed with the ones where like after something really horrible happened. And I think I've said this to you guys on a podcast, one of the a previous podcasts is like he had something really horrible happen. Like there was a a story arc years ago where the toy man gets Cat Grant's kid, and like um Cat Grant's kid ends up, helps all the other kids escape, but um he ends up dying. And Superman felt like that he should have been able to do more, but it was just one of those situations that he couldn't have done more. And just because he has godlike powers doesn't mean that he can be everywhere at all times. And you know, it ends with him sitting at home in Kansas with his with Mom and Pa Kent at the at the at the breakfast table, and they're just like kind of just talking to him like, "Son, just because you you have all these amazing powers doesn't mean you can be everywhere at all times. Like that kid saved all those other kids because of you." because of his, his love and respect for you and you inspired him to be a hero. And that's what you do to people. You inspire other people. And that's what I, what I've always loved about Superman. And this is kind of a perfect example of that because his family is so important to him. Yeah. And this whole book's really about that. Like the entire book is. And as far as like a, a thing, I mean, yeah, it's, it's definitely stuff that's shown throughout these stories. Just in general. Uh, we got to score that little story there, Josh. Um, I get a four and a half. Right on. Rob? I'd, I'd give it a solid four. I, I thought it was really well done. I like a lot of the connections that it makes beyond like what's going on right then. Because we, we hear a little bit about like what's happening with the family. But yeah, I, I, I thought it was a really well done story. And it was kind of neat that it tied into the last uh, story in that 
the last story in the background we have playing that the universe is eventually going to destroy itself. Oh, yeah. And here we are, like the universe is destroying itself. Right, yeah. Seems or at least our solar system, I should say. Those two particular stories kind of connect together, sort of. I don't know if that was on purpose or not, but if it's okay. It might just be placement in the book. It probably is. But nevertheless, it's Tom King's first little Superman outing. I think he did a good job. So that's awesome. Um, yeah, I give it a four also. I mean, as far as the story, we do join it at the end of Earth. And what well, Superman's talking about visiting there, it's all the times he's returned to visit Earth and wherever everyone else is at. They must be living someplace else. So there's definitely a bigger part to whatever's happening in that particular story that we don't get. But the part that we get is really kind of awesome. Anyway, see, so yeah, I give, give that little, little, little piece there a four. I guess I shouldn't call it a little piece. I give that piece a four. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. So the next little story in there is, uh, five minutes. Yeah, five minutes, uh, written by Louise Simonson with art by Jerry Ordway. And this is kind of a very, like, slice of life sort of story with Superman. Clark Kent's trying to finish his his article before the press has to go in, and we got to, like, get beyond the deadline of this five minutes. But being Clark, being Superman, he can't just finish this article because he sees, oh, no, there's, like, a train that's going out of control. And so he flies out and takes care of that. And while he's out there, oh, well, there's a mugging going on. Well, I got to stop that. And then there's a uh, space debris that's falling down, and it's not burning up in the atmosphere. Well, i got to stop that. And so he's just running around, you know, saving the day all in a day's work while trying to still beat his everyday, like, deadline for his job. And by the time he gets back and he finishes the article and sends it out, Perry's like, oh, no, 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 that's old news. Now we need you to go out and, like, cover this thing where Superman stopped this train and Superman stopped this robbery and, you know... So it's kind of an interesting dyke comedy. It's a, it's about Superman's fast-paced life, kind of. Well, and then how he tries to balance it between Clark Kent. It just as a thing, yeah, it's a real kind of neat jump-around type thing, but it's pretty cool. I, that whole chase of how much he can get done in one day versus other people. And the whole time he's really, he's really worried about it is he's worried about making pa- Perry upset and messing up the paper. So kind of awesome. Well, that, and I mean, it also shows kind of there's kind of this theory that, oh, well, if he has all this power, why does anything bad happen? Well, even Superman has limits. Right. Even though in five minutes he can do so much, there's still things that he can't do. Right. And if he did, what would life be? It would just be life under the thumb of Superman. Right. But uh, the other end is, you know, it it kind of shows, again, the, the idea that, you know, Superman doesn't need to have any kind of job. But he does it because it, it challenges him. And that's something that he actually likes, is it? It actually has something to... Show his humanity? Yeah, kind of, well, it, it's something that he hit, none of his special abilities make him any better at. Right. So it's just really something that he's achieved on his own. But yeah, it's, it's kind of just the fast-paced life of himself and, and his, his job as a writer. I Knock it off. You guys score for that book, Rob? Or score for that story, Rob? You know, I, I, I'd say probably a three. This this definitely is a big callback to a lot of the older stuff for Superman. I enjoyed it. It's a cool take on him. It has a lot of name drops for kind of significant stuff or significant characters for Superman. Callbacks, yeah. Okay. But I, I'd, I'd put a three. All right. uh, Josh, what do you think about that story? Uh, I give it a three and a half. Um, he was good. It was just it was kind of I think the story they were trying to tell in this one was just it was. And I think it was, a, it was a little cheesier. I think that's that's the problem. Some people can't write Superman. Like it's it's one of the he's a he's a hard character to write, and like this one was one of those ones that's trying to show his like I don't know a little more cheesy than the ones for you. Yeah, he, he almost does too much. Right in in the five minutes. Right, like it's you know I I can see that being like like an hour's worth of stuff for like five minutes. So like yeah. I do like that Bibbo shows up in there, though. I always like Bibbo. <laughs> that's one of those callbacks that is like, if you don't know, you don't know. But that's, yeah, it was pretty neat. Yeah, he's like the, he's from like. He's um, a old, it's old school character, man. Yeah, it's like Superman's like. Drunken sidekick, sort of. Yeah. <laughs> Except not really a sidekick. Yeah, Superman, he's my number one. <laughs> right. Um, well, yeah, I give it a three also. But as far as a story, I wasn't disappointed in it. And I think it's neat. I, th- I thought the, the, all the callbacks were really cool because we don't get that with a lot of these other ones. But they were pretty neat. Right? So I thought it was awesome. So as far as stories, 
So the next story in the arc is uh, Superman Land? Is that what it uh, is? Action Land. Action Land, excuse me. No, that's right. Action, there's got to be a better way to say that. Action Land! No, that doesn't sound right. No, it doesn't sound good. Yeah. Well, sounds great. There's a reason I don't do voiceover work unless it's swearing. No, yeah, well. Uh, <laughs> so uh, this one is written by um, Paul Dini, and the uh, pencils are by uh, Jose Luis Garcia Lopez. Wow. So that, there are a lot, of, a lot of names for me to check on there. He's got a lot of names. That is a, that is a very long name. That's impressive. <laughs> So this guy opens up, and basically what we're doing is we, we're magically at a theme park that is Suitman flavored, and we have a hostess with the mostess, who's uh, there to take us on our tour. And uh, there's a whole group of people that are there lined up as amusement park voyeurs, or, or what do you call that? Patrons, there you go. Mm-hmm. And uh, she loads them onto a recreation of Suitman's original rocket, and we're going to take you on the tour. And they blast off, and the whole time she's talking about... How Superman originally came from Krypton, and then we have this whole scene about, oh, if you want to, you can stand next to him and take pictures around the tractor that he first lifted up, and then they show a picture of him as a small child flying up a tractor, pretty much. And we get other flashes of him fighting things and talk about how he was the leader of the Justice League, and then they start talking about all of his battles, and we get a whole bunch of flashes of that, and as we talk about the battles, things seem to take a little bit of a turn... In the style of what's being presented, and then we get to his greatest battle of all, and his death, and uh, from there we get to reveal who who the uh, who the one who took Superman out is because it wasn't Doomsday, it wasn't Lex Luthor, it wasn't a slew of other villains that we get to see, but it's Mixelixplick, Mixelixplick, Mister Mixelixplick. Yes, there you go. I only had to take three times to say it this time. You know, I I probably always say it wrong. That's understandable. I think everybody has a different pronunciation. pronunciation. That's probably true. Anyhow, well, about that time, all of a sudden the ride fades away and the people that were there fade away. And we are left with our tour guide, who's now dressed a lot less tour guidey and a little more. What's that character from Streets of Rage with the pink hair that you fight with the chains of the chick? Poison? What's, there you go. More, a lot more like poison. Anyhow, well, we want to find out this is uh, Mixelplex's lady, and uh, well, Mister Mixelplex. Mixes right. Pitlick. There you go. I'll just have you say that whenever I need to say it. Okay. I like the Super Friends translation, which was just Mixelplex. Oh yeah, that's what they call them. That's the Super Friends. So yeah, you no, know, it's not canon. So whatever. So she mentions to him, of course, well, you never can finish this part. I think it's because you really don't want it to ever finish, which is really kind of awesome. And while this story isn't particularly about Superman himself, it's more about how one of his, like, not the most hated villains, but but a pretty dangerous villain that's tried to erase him from reality, has, like, a, a almost an undying respect for him. Like, they're, so Batman has Joker, and the two of them play off each other for their whole reason for existing. Mix a lick, Mix his pit lick. There you go. Need Superman for his existence. And there's a little fun catch at the end where we, we get to see the, a couple of the other, uh, other imps. imps Fourth for, dimension imps. Yeah. And it, as a story, it's pretty cute. I mean, it, it's one of those things that, like, this particular story, while it's not really about Superman, it's about the weird respect that even his villains have for him for the most part. And I don't know, it's kind of a fun thing. Like, all the imagery is really fun. Like, her costume is really fun. Uh, Score-wise, I mean, I give it a three. Storyline-wise, it's more fun than anything else, and Paul Dini's kind of known for that stuff. So as far as, like, a story, I thought it was really cool. I, I, I like the way they use mix, mix... Mixes Pitlick. There you go. How did the Super Friends say it? Mixelplick. Mixelplick. Mr. Mixelplick. But there's no... It doesn't change there's anything. There's no L there, so, like, that's what's weird. Yeah. That's how I said it in the old show. I go with that because I can say it. It's understandable. So yeah, I give it a three. Art's good. Story's fun. That's that's all I got. I'm, I'm done. I like the I like the hostess with the mostess. I think she's great. Yeah, I I would follow suit with a three. This is really it feels very inspired by the um, Superman animated series that yeah. came out for a while. I see that. Uh, I know she has appeared in both that animated series and then she's she's appeared in several comics before. But I think that particular animation caught the idea of missile Plick so much better than than most things because i mean he's he can be a really annoying enemy and he hasn't shown up as a real 
Well, I guess I shouldn't say that because I mean he showed up pretty recently as a, as kind of a real deal threat, but like he was kind of a golden age guy, right? But they get the idea of him across very quickly in this story, and I think in that particular animated they do as well. For me, he'll always have Gilbert Godfrey's voice, so <laughs> that's going to always stick with me along with the Super Friends interpretation. So it's a great gazoo, dum dum, mm. awesome. Josh, what do you think about that story? I give it a three. Um, I know it's, it's a little weird. Little, little off, but yeah, I, I like what you said that how like most of his villains have a, have a like a weird respect for him. weird respect. But you know, there's a lot of DC characters that are that way. Like the the Rogues Gallery for um like the Flash, like all the all the Rogues for the Flash have um, tons of respect for the for the speedsters. Like they have like an unwritten rule: never kill a speedster, etc. Like so, there's all these other you know. I mean, Bat- Batman's villains, I think, truly hate him. Most of them. A majority of them, yeah, I would like say. They want to kill him, but like Superman's villain, like, I mean, it's kind of hard to say. I mean, some of like Dark Side, like, has always has other things on his mind, but like Doomsday was just pure rage. But like, is, you know, a lot, a lot, like, even Lex Luthor, I think it, it at, the, at the heart of it, has a respect for Superman. He at least respects who he is and what he is. He's, he's almost envious of him to an extent, like. Well, that's for sure, yeah. But yeah, like, Makes his pit look as funny. <laughs> I like there's that up that the animated series that I think it's the animated series episode where he first shows up and and that and like Superman ha- keeps have to trick him to say his his name backwards. That's the only way you can get rid of him. Yeah, so like he like I just the one scene that r- always made me laugh is he was just like to get away from him. He's like you can't run away from me, Superman. And so Superman's like flying through the air, but he like but he spells his name backwards and like the guys chased him as he spells his name backwards. And by just like, by like flying through that, that's like him basically saying his name backwards. It's fine. And like, so he disappears, but I, yeah, I always liked it. It's like the Beetlejuice syndrome. Hilarious. Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Exactly. And the only time that I was really not super happy with a, a Miss Pickle story or, you know, whatever was, uh, towards the beginning of new 52, and Grant was trying to make him some kind of pseudo hero. It was weird, and it the less talked about that, the better. I don't even know why I brought it up. Thanks a lot. Yeah, because what we really need is angels to kill Superman. Yeah, it's terrible. Thanks a lot, Rob. He, I mean, he 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 isn't always evil. No, he's so not. he's he's just kind of annoying. But in that storyline, it wasn't it, even that didn't play out to be right. But I mean, honestly, if you if you want to check out one that's really awesome with him, the King Joker. Storyline where, oh, yeah. where McGinnis was drawing Superman at the time. He's yeah. awesome. Yeah. And that's all thanks to the Joker gets those powers. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's good stuff. Yeah. Pre New 52, but it was that was good. the Superman Batman. Yep. Mm-hmm. That's fantastic. And that's where you first see like uh, Bizarro Batman, I think, is the first. It's during that comic book series, but I don't think it's during that storyline. Yeah. I would say it's. That's, he shows up for that. Is I will it during say storyline? I will say it's the first time we see a good Bizarro Batman. And suit, and you get to see. Bizarro, come on yeah. now. You get, you get to see that Superwoman and that Batwoman, and it's like all the different realities because Joker's going crazy. And he's, well, that particular batch is, that particular batch of books jump through different realities. That yeah. first Batman Superman, like it started grounded in normal reality and then moved around all kinds of places. Because at one point we had a whole legion of other super characters the bat daughter and yeah it was it was a cool series it was fun like mcginnis drawing that stuff was great too we also had the pseudo avengers i can't even remember what those guys were called because they weren't the avengers but they were basically the avengers and you mean from the justice league no from a different universe oh okay yeah it was it was cool i can't God, I remember what those guys are called that's good stuff all right august okay, so let's move on to the next story rob next story is what faster than a speeding bullet Dun, dun, dun. This one's cool. Written by Brad Mills, and then art by John Cassidy. Yeah, John Cassidy. Uh, and basically, this is like a snapshot of one situation that's it's it's all just kind of told in Superman's mind. He's too far away to stop a situation that's going bad very quickly. And it's, it's, you know, it kind of highlights the idea of Fast and the Speeding Bullet. Like, he knows that he's not going to arrive before this bullet is shot. And kind of as, as the story goes, what we're dealing with is, like, what the lady does and what he thinks he can do and what he ultimately is able to push past, I guess. It, it's about people that inspire Superman as well. 
Right. So yeah, kind of throw back to the first story. Like throughout this book, we get pieces like that. But I mean, you're getting like a like three or four page story that's all just something that takes place in like less than a second. Right. Literally from the point of a trigger being pulled to the bullet emerging from the gun. So, and it's it's a pretty cool story. For me, I don't know if this one quite sold it. I wasn't super happy with the look of it and well, just for me, I guess it wasn't wasn't quite there. I'd I'd say probably like 2.5. <laughs> but that's just me. Sure. I I really liked it actually. I give it like a four and a half, just because it was like so. It all it takes place in like milliseconds. Like the whole thing is just like takes place, and it just shows like Superman's incredible speed and abilities, and he's just like how. But he's also he's genius level. He's he's just as smart, if not smarter, than anybody else in the DC universe. They just don't ever touch on that. And he's like, can he? Because he's and he's always learning, and it's like his brain works like his. Is super enhanced by the yellow sun as well. So it's just like, and he's just like figuring out the math and the timing. And he's like, I'm not going to make it. And then, yeah, that was awesome. It's, it's all right. Link even likes it. He can't read though. So yes, he can. No, I can't. How do you know? Pretty positive. Silly. But yeah. As far as, like you said, the thing that was really cool in here is he talks about he's going faster than he's ever gone before, except for when, and he mentions, they sort of mentioned pot can't. So like the heart attack. And that, that's something else I feel like is really missed in New 52. Now granted, since the emergence of both universes or whatever, I guess it's back. But like, that was one of the biggest things that pissed me off in the new 52 lineup whenever they made Mom and Pa Kent die in a fire in a, in a crash. Yeah, die in a car crash. It was like the most trivial thing in the world. Like the whole point of Pa Kent's death being what it was is, is, be, is a heart attack. It's just something Superman just couldn't fix. And like, and they missed that point so hard, I felt like, in the New 52 stuff. Now granted, since the whole rebirth, emergence, and everything combining together, I'm gonna go with the story making the old, the heart attack, the actual death, and just move forward. I think it's just that we, we have both with Superman. Which is, he, okay, he remembers yes. both at this point. Sure. I can live with that, I guess. Um, as far as score for the other storyline, or for that particular story, you know, I give, I give it a three. I mean, I thought it was pretty neat. I'll give it a little more classic art style, so it's not quite contemporary what I normally like. But I like it just fine the way it works. And, like, the catch at the end when he's talking to the lady, it it's just, like, uh, one of those things that's really cool. And, like, what he says to her and their, their conversation at the end of the story really sells that piece of it. So, like, I like that a lot. And I'd like to quote it, but I don't want to take away from people. They really should read it. Especially if you don't understand Superman. If you don't understand Superman, this is a book that you need to read. And if you say, well, I understand him, he's got powers. Well, everybody you read probably has powers, so shut up. That's my short yeah, answer. You're, you're still missing the point. Yeah. Right. Anyhow, okay, well, let's move on to, to our last our last story. Yeah, which is going to be kind of the, the big step off. Well, this is the this is one of the, the, the other firsts in this book, and this book's got a bunch of different firsts in it, but this one is the first uh, Brian Michael Bendis story. Okay. And it, it also alludes to one I didn't, I didn't know was coming out, which is Man of Steel. So I guess he's going to work on Superman action and Man of Steel, which is a mini. Yeah, there's going to be a mini series of Man of Steel just by itself, which initially I thought he was doing that guy and the other two were going to finish up their own runs, but apparently he's taking over all of them. So we're going to have Man of Steel, action, and Superman. Bendis is doing all of them? Yes, he is. Oh, sweet. So that'll be interesting. Are they going to write into one another? Don't know yet. Like storyline wise, what I expected was for Superman to finish its run with Tomasi and uh Gleason, but they're gonna be doing the one shot specials that finish up both action and so the Dan Jurgen storyline is gonna end in the one shot special and then the Peter Tomasi story for Superman is gonna end in the one shot. So apparently all three of these are gonna start or I don't know if they're in tandem or not, because it kinda makes it sound like it is. Now order wise, at least at the start they don't. Since Man of Steel is a mini series, I imagine it has a particular story to it. Rather than what's going on in action in Superman. So I don't think that one will touch the other two, but you never know. Uh, the story, the name of this particular story is The Truth. And, uh, the artist by, uh, Jim Lee. So of X-Men fame and other things. And of course written by Brian Michael Bendis, if we didn't mention that earlier. Uh, so when we open up, we're basically opening up with Superman getting his ass kicked. I mean, that's what's happening. Like he's, He's getting knocked all around the city. There's explosions everywhere, and he winds up colliding into this little cafe-type shop. And uh, 
that leads us to meet a couple girls who are both in the middle of the crazy chaos. And one's like, oh my god, it's Superman. I've looked at her for five years. I, I've never even seen him. This is amazing. This is the greatest thing ever. And the other one's like, uh, you got insurance, right? This is going to be a problem. <laughs> Which I thought was hilarious. Because she's like, my, my cousin had a problem. And it's great. Um, yeah, they talk about Red Tornado. Right, yeah, they mentioned the Red Tornado destroying some stuff. She's basically talking about the episode of the Red Tornado and how it caused so many problems. And uh, from there, the, both of them are like, oh, we, we should probably help him. Like, what, what can we do? And about that time, um, we get introduced to a new villain um, that I don't think anybody's ever seen before. I haven't seen before. So I'm going to go with this being the first appearance. And he basically comes running out of the fire yelling Kryptonian as he chases the bounced body of Superman. As a th- I mean, as a thing, he looks crazy. Like, he really does. He's all, like, war-torn. He's got this crazy outfit, lots of teeth, and, like, his face is very, like, it's like I don't know, it's like a messed up monster. Like, his lips are all are out and around his teeth. It's crazy. Yeah, it's like he almost is wearing a f- face mask, like a human's face as a mask. Kind it's of. massively scarred and damaged, looks yeah. like to me. Definitely has a missing nose. Piranha teeth face. And he's got a fancy axe. Right. Well, we get introduced to his... He gives himself gives his name out a little bit later. Um, but just so people know, this is this is Rogue Lazar. Rogue Olzar. Let me spell it for you. It's R-O-G-O-L, then Z-A-A-R. That's two A's in there. Rogue Lazar. And uh, as he's pursuing the take Superman out, we get a interlude of a, well, he winds up getting, the girls drag Superman, for, okay, so sorry, let me rewind for a second. The girls drag Superman behind the counter to try to hide him from Rogue Lazar. And the entire time this is going on, he's basically just talking trash about he's going to exterminate Kryptonians. That's what his whole goal has been. And about this time, Superman starts to come around and he thanks the girls for helping him. And they're both like, oh yeah, are you going to be all right? And he's like, oh, I guess we'll see, we'll see. And uh, about that time, Superman stands up and he gets another whooping. And it seems him flying at the front of a bookstore. And we get this really cool, like, action sequence where we see the people in the bookstore. And at least one of them sees Superman coming at the window. And the Superman's like, oh no, I gotta stop. I gotta stop. And he manages to stop himself just before he gets to the glass door or glass window of the store, destroying everything. Which is kind of freaking awesome. And about that time we get the reveal of there's somebody else there to help, which is Supergirl. And that leads to a little more fighting. And then, uh, Rogue Lazar dispatches her fairly quickly and tells her, I'll be back to deal with you later. And he continues his onslaught on Superman, and we get a whole bunch of jibber-jabber talk from him that has showed up on a bunch of other um, review sites about retconning the history of Superman. However, I don't think that's what it really is. No, I don't think it, so either. It's, yeah, that's just... I, it, I think that's a lot of jump on the gun about stuff that right can be actually pretty easily explained. I'm pretty sure that's going to be the case. Uh, but... but I want to leave off the end of the thing only because of where they leave him sitting at, but because of all the other podcasts and all the other news shows, like what Rogue Lazar claims is that he's the reason Krypton was destroyed and he's going to exterminate all Kryptonians. Just like I told your father. Dun, dun, dun. And like the easy answer to this is, okay, so this is something Jarrell dealt with back in the day and he's a trash talker. So it's no different than than um, Zod saying, "I want to kill your whole family. Everyone that's crypt from the house L will reap the world wind of my whatever." As he's trapped in the Phantom Zone, so like it's exactly the same thing. I think if it winds up being more than that, then maybe Bendis is bitten off where he can chew and he's knock it the hell off. But you know, it's the first thing, so who knows? And Rogue Lazar does look crazy, and the story moves pretty quick and is written really fun. Um, so score wise, I give it a four. I thought the art was great. It means Jim Lee, so it's hard to beat Jim Lee in general. Yeah, it is. Like when Jim does a full book or does interiors, even anything Jim does is kind of awesome. Uh, I wish the guy had more time in life of being a co-publisher of a comic book company and running the, all the DC Online stuff. The dude's a busy dude. So as far as that goes, art's great. Stories was fun. I thought it was really good. Uh, I give it, did I say four? I give it a four. I thought you said for you. Okay, then. Rob, what do you know about that book? Uh, you know, or story. I, Excuse I, me. I enjoyed it as well. I'd probably give it a 3.5. I, I liked it, but I don't know if I liked it as much as some of the one-shot stuff that was going on. But there was a couple of things that just kind of annoyed me. And most of it was probably the ladies trying to pull him back behind the counter 
and they're they're talking about his costume change. Oh yeah, that was pretty it's, heavy in there. It's actually, a little yeah. too much for me, but for the most part, I think I think it's done really well, and I, I totally think that this is an easy explanation. And I'm really surprised people are like, "Oh my god, whole origin change." <laughs> I don't I don't think so. <laughs> Throw the ground. Yeah. All right, Josh, what do you know about that story? Uh, it was good. I give it like three and three quarters to four ish. You know, I really actually, I know you guys are like, like, like heaping Jim Lee's pra- praise and all. I, I thought he, like, as far as Jim Lee goes, as, as good as he is on a regular basis, I thought it was kind of drawn weak. Like he was in a hurry or something. I was like, I, I wasn't, I wasn't a fan. Hmm. Like it took me a minute to realize it was Jim Lee because it was kind of shoddy. In my opinion, like I was like, uh, like I, 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 th- I, I think back to like when he drew Superman for that Batman arc that he did. Oh and yeah. Superman yeah. is drawn so well in that, and this one was like, eh, it was all right. Like he could have done better. I feel like he was kind of rushed. Like you said, he's a busy guy, but it's just like for Action One Thousand. I mean, I feel like he could have taken a little bit more time. Yeah, it might be the anchor too. You never know. Yeah, it's, it's possible. You know, who knows? It just it yeah. was it was noticeably weak to me. But I mean, that's the whole thing, right? You know, you got. Three people, three opinions. That's that's just how it is. Right. You know, nobody should be like, no, no, you have to like Jim Lee. Right. <laughs> and I love Jim Lee. That's the thing is, I just I was like, yeah. it, like I said, it took me a minute to realize it was him because I was like, it wasn't as good as it as he can do that I've seen him do. That's but, true. Well, and there's there's a book that we're going to talk about, or we've talked about either either or with Jim on it that the Mortal Men number that, one that wasn't mm-hmm. so great. Yeah, it, had, it, it, was, it was so great. There's pieces in there. But I don't know if that was really him or not. But yeah, you you would hope that he would have gotten to spend as much time as he as he does. But I mean, he also is not in this game all the time anymore. That's true. But for for me, I thought it was fine. I I really I still liked it. I thought it was good work. But I stop beating it to death now. No, I mean, it's <laughs> it's an interesting story. If this, this like starting off as like the first arc that like it, it it's a cool idea. We'll see see where it goes. Like. There's always someone claiming to be the destroyer of Krypton and wants to end. But this guy says all Krypton, Krypton in general, not just like Superman's line. Right. right. Well, no, yeah. It's, it's a idea of the planet versus, which then begged me the question, well, does he know about the Daxamites? Or and does he know Kryptonians? about, yeah, and does he know about like how Zod's off fighting the Green Lanterns? Like that's, Zod still exists and he's Kryptonian, so he's not doing that good of a job. No. He's kind of. Yeah, that's true. Well, and I feel like we kind of picked the story up sort of quarter way in. Well, it's in progress, obviously, because yeah. of the beatdown happening. But okay. I find it unlikely that we have a body count of everybody else and then Superman. Oh, no, no. Yeah. And the other end is, like, he knows Kara. Oh, well, that's which, true. Which, you know, yeah. was significant to me. But I, I kind of wonder if this is only the Man of Steel story. It may very well be. You know, and people are like, oh, my gosh, this is what the whole arc for everything that's coming out is I kind of think it maybe isn't. I kind of think it's just Man of Steel. It could be. Mm-hmm. It would make a lot of sense if that was what it was. Its own start for its own story, for its own thing. Yeah. Just like uh, Unchained was. Yeah. Very similar. I, hopefully it has more connection than Unchained did. Unchained mm-hmm. was kind of cool, but it really... It was its own thing. In, in the end, all be all, unfortunately, it touches nothing. Right. Well, aftermath-wise, it was still a good story. If you get a chance to read it, you should. But it, yeah. release-wise, it took forever, and it connecting anywhere it didn't ever connect anywhere. No. So, but as a standalone story, it was all right. Not, I liked it. Not yet. Dun dun dun. Maybe. No. Well, whatever. I like. I just like doing the effect that and the air horn. The blah, 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 air horns. I love this. I think that's great. Can't get enough of the John Cena catches and memes. John Cena, you know what I'm talking about. There's no way you guys don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, no, well, we know. I, I, I don't know what you're talking That's about. That's not true. You definitely know. I don't. Seriously? Oh, the John Cena, I'll have to play you one. No, I'm good. You stay tuned. You're, you're going to get one, at least one. I'm good. Maybe a whole bunch of them. Um, all right, so uh, let's see. So, Rob, what did you learn today? I think that's the next step of the show, isn't it? It is. Oh, overall score. So I was writing down notes as we went. Overall, between all of our different scores, we come up with an average of four point like twenty five. So overall score, I'm going to go ahead and do. We just gave it a four and a half because it lands on the higher side. Cause it's not like a full four point two five, but it's a higher end of that. Anyway, so there. That's the group score, I guess. Now, Rob, what'd you learn today? 
I learned that Superman's buoys evidently represent hope. <laughs> it's not just the symbol. It's the red underoos. <laughs> that so, is so all, all the people who were like, oh my gosh, he finally got rid of the panties. That was just him losing hope. That which is a sad thing. Now it's back. <laughs> that is hilarious. Oh, man, that's a good one. Josh, what did you learn today? Maybe just that his super belt was at the dry cleaner, so that's why the red under is just his backup <laughs> costume. It's not. I'm going to go with that's a possibility, I guess. So for 52 issues, five years, he didn't have his belt. Well, double that because there's action and Superman. So for five years still with 104 books, he and Guy's belt back. They drew his belt in there. But that's, that's good enough reason, maybe. I can see that. I mean, we don't see him every day, so maybe, you know, he switches his costume up and, like, his newer one is just at the dry cleaner. Like, you know, they're not self-cleaning. <laughs> That's true. The guy's got to get smelly at one point. Just because he's Superman doesn't mean he doesn't sweat. All right. All right. I, I can live with that, I guess. Uh, Rob, what did I learn today? You learned that if you're going to try to tell a big story about the return of the original costume for Superman. You just don't do anything with it at all. You just pretend like this is just how it's always been. <laughs> That's a terrible thing to learn, it's, but I guess I did. It's like an animal who comes in who's torn up the trash, and you're like, did you do this? And the dog's just like not looking at your eyes. It's the same thing. <laughs> if you just don't look at it, it doesn't acknowledge it. <laughs> this is just how it's always been. You're You're the weird one. <laughs> what do you mean he didn't have those on? Why are you even looking there? <laughs> the, that, that explanation about the about the trash was awesome. Totally, totally worth it. This entire show, totally worth it. I, I don't know why they keep trying to change the costume. They've tried to change it like a zillion times, and it always comes back. Go mm -hmm. with not a zillion, but but yeah, it, it was a big deal when Air Fifty Two happened, and then afterwards, now we're just back to normal. So uh, it, it's kind of the it's kind of the problem that I've always said that like Superman fans have. They want something different, but if you change anything, they just will not accept it, and it has to go right back to what it was, and then they're like, oh, it's the same. They don't ever do anything different with Superman. Well, they gave him the long hair, and then everybody was like, oh, it's all different, because he was dead, and he has long hair now. And I hate it. And then they cut it off, because like, everybody's like, yeah, his hair is stupid now, we're over it. Well, when they, when they cut it back to the mullet, it was pretty bad. It was always just that. That was just what it was. Like, right. It was long and then just short. And then, like, the electric Superman costumes. Red and blue boogaloo? Heck yeah. And, you know, that was, everybody's like, oh, they're going to switch it up a little bit. And, you know, written well, it was decent for a minute, but it was like, eh. And then they, like, had the black on the M for a while during the Imperiax storyline when McGinnis was drawn in. Right. And that was really cool. It was cool, but it's the same problem, like. And then the new 50, well, he did it for a reason. There was an explanation, and he's like, it wasn't going to be there forever. It was for, he well, was. For a storyline. Yeah. But it stayed for a while, and then, you know, and then, like, the new 52 stuff, original Superman, pre-52 Superman, this costume is slightly different from the the new 52 Superman's costume. They're a little different, so, I mean, I don't know. And they, you know, doesn't have as pointy of eyes. <laughs> I think it just depends who draws him where he has pointy eyes or not. <laughs> That's true. It's all a matter who draws him there. But yeah, as far as the, the costume, like everyone says they want something different, then as soon as they change it, then they all lose their minds because yeah. they don't really want anything different. I, I did kind of think that we were going to see something about the costume switch. Yeah. Because the right. costume was kind of a big deal in the New 52. Oh, it definitely was, yeah. And I mean, even Lee doesn't draw with the like the high collar or the armor or anything. So. Well, no, it's back to the old costume, so but the rest of, course, of the stuff is gone. Maybe action and Superman is going to be where it really tells that story. Either that or it's it's going to be the dog in the trash. I mean, really. Dog in the trash. That's I think, I think that's actually the answer, but we'll see. That's why I agree with that. Um, all right. Well, let's see. Uh, you want to do some books and watch, and then we'll call it, call it, call it. Sure. Punch, punch out. Womp, 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 womp. No? That's only for me? Okay. Yeah. Rob, books to watch? Um, we got a lot of stuff from Marvel starting over here pretty soon, so we're going to have the Immortal Hulk. We'll have Avengers. We're going to have... You mean volumizing? Well, yeah, they're, okay. they're going to be starting at once, so... Volumizing. Yeah, yeah, whatever. Uh, most of the X titles have been doing really well. If you have seen it yet, Domino is really well done. Iron Fist is actually doing a lot of really cool stuff right now. It's not getting a lot of love, so check that out. Unfortunately, Super Sons is coming to an end, so if you didn't get it for some reason, 
now is the time because that was actually a pretty inspired run. Yeah, that's uh, freaking great. Uh, Wayward and Birthright are, of course, fantastic. And uh, Deadly Class and East to West that may or may not be going on to showing up on your silver screen on the TV. So, yeah, according to the current information about it, they're going to be releasing it on uh, Amazon. I wonder if we need to change that. Like this, because, you know, they, they, it was like, what, the the gold screen was big, was the, the, the theater, and the silver screen was TV? No, the silver screen was the theater. That was the silver mm-hmm. screen? Okay. Back in the old days, because they didn't have TV the same way we have it now. Oh, that's true. So I guess we've never updated that, so no, we, we can't get, like, a new screen for mm-hmm. for the for the computer. Well, there's the idiot box, which, I mean, okay. that's, uh, that's another name for the sort, TV. Sort of like that. I would, I would say the crystal screen. Crystal screen. For the internet. Oh. Ah. That's where it's going to go. Well, there you go. That's, that's a... That's a fancy copyright that. Fancy. Yes. Show up on the crystal screen. <laughs> don't don't do it like a hoedown. That doesn't that doesn't help your cause. The gore screen, because he says he invented that. Well that in the internet and pants, but we don't give him credit for the pants, do we? You always say the pants thing. It's true. That's and true. and what is that called with the global global warming? There you go. Thanks, Al Gore. You're making global warming. Thanks a lot. Jerk. Um, now books to watch. Well, I, I would say try to look out for the bridge book. I think that'll be cool. I mean, it is not normal comic book format, but as far as a thing, I think it should be cool to check out. It's a hit book about history, so that's cool. Um, as far as other storylines, still super sorted for, uh, Glory. What's, man, I can't remember the name of it. That's terrible. Death or Glory. There you go. Death or Glory. And that's what it is. It took me a minute to remember. Um, I think that'll be awesome. Black Science is still great. Uh, Domino it was great. I uh, really dug the first issue of uh, of uh, Brimstone. It, very setup-y, but I, I dug it. I thought it was awesome. Um, I feel like there's two other ones in there from Image that I really wanted to talk about, but now I can't remember what they are. I guess that means they didn't matter that much. Take that. Books. Josh, you got any books to watch? Mm, no. Okay. That's understandable. There's one we haven't talked about, which was Dark Arc. Which oh. I, I do think that's We've talked done. about it in the past, but yeah, Dark... No, it's still going. Oh, it's it, still- the first volume came out like three weeks ago, and it's supposed to pick back up, I want to say, I think two weeks from... Well, time doesn't matter on the internet, so it is restarting soon. Or we're not restarting, it's picking back up soon, so issue six. But yeah, Dark Arc, great. <clears throat> If you, if we, if you haven't listened to this before when we talked about it, um, so you got Noah's Ark, and then you have the other Ark. Bum, bum, bum. Oh, and her, and her, her, uh, her Infernal Descent. Um, not from Image, but from, uh, Aftershock. It's like a Dante's Inferno, but with a woman trying to save her kids' souls. And the first issue of that's pretty good. I mean, our main character is a little older than I like in a normal main character, but, yeah, it, it, first issue is pretty good. So I'd say check that out if you get a chance. It's good stuff. Uh, anything else, lads? No? Just a key. Just a key. Just a key. Just a key. Just a key.